Good morning, everybody out there in YouTube land. How y'all doing today? Uh, it is I, Yamez, uh, your goofy host of the Sunday morning uh, gathering. And I just blanked on my normal start. <laughs> okay, yeah. Wow. What up? We've got Trail Dust, Olberk. Forge, Ben Toons, Transcendental Artist Studios, and several other lurkers that I'm not going to, you know, what up, Mr. Whitney, how you doing? Um, anywho, uh, yes, so uh, we've got a interesting show carrying on uh, uh, from what we had discussed uh, last week and the week prior. Um, what's up, uh, Boar? What up, Jack? Um let people kind of filter in here, and then we'll get started with the how was your week. Um, <laughs> it's a kilt-wearing day. Yeah, it's uh, it's almost time for me to start getting to the major yard work, the usual yard work. Um, I did a bit of clearing yesterday, uh, moving some stuff around, and I still got more. I've got about like 10 wire spools that I need to move, uh, some wood I need to get over by the, by the fire pit. And, uh, a big, like 10 by 10 garage door <laughs> that I need to, like the old style that just flips up, not segmented. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet, but it's neat to have. Uh, anyway, so, uh, I suppose we'll go on to the, how was your week segment? And, uh, we'll begin with, uh, whoever gets excited enough to start. I know yeah, Adam sure. is... Uh, yeah, yeah I, I typically, uh, 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 you know, because Adam, Adam's going to drone on. No. Uh, hey, it gives me uh, time to get my taxes done. Uh, got, got to work a couple days, and, uh, oh, see, this is my, obviously, this is my days off uh, of the month, so I'm sitting at home. I got a lot of stuff done. Like, I worked in the forge all day yesterday, uh, just knocking out little projects. Uh, uh, working on, uh, I'm doing, I'm working on a, um, uh, what do you call it? A tankless water heater install, which I've been working on for about a month now, and I'm probably not going to finish until next month. Uh, I've got almost everything done except for, uh, uh, hooking up the plumbing and running the main power from the pole to the breaker box. But, uh, yeah, I made some, uh, little deals for, uh, uh, the wire to rest on and, uh, made a, made a couple clamps and, and then I got bored. So I made my first, uh, hatchet slash ax, uh, which I've never done that before. It's got a welded in, uh, welded in bit from, uh, uh, farrier's rasp. Uh, I did, after I finished all of that, I started working on my, uh, monthly blacksmithing challenge project and I, it, it's a, um, a boot scraper and it has to have a, a scroll element and only traditional, or, or not traditional because it would be antiquated um, uh, fastening techniques. So it means you, you know uh, you can't use like any type of welding. It's got to be like rivets or collars or something like that. And um, so I started working on that. And I don't have anything that's like really small enough to do to do um, nice elegant scrolls. So I was building mine out of three quarter inch round stock. And, and I mean, and I had the, the, the scraper bit, I'd already like, uh, done that out of a piece of, um, uh, a, a jaw from a set of slips and I had already hammered the angle into it and got it all set and punched the holes in it where it'll rivet onto the, to the, the whole thing. And so like I got in the vice over here, I've got my big ass piece of round stock and I, I heated it up in the forge, put it in the vice and I started uh, doing the scrolling on it. And then I got my torch out to. You know, so I could just continue heating it uh, as I was scrolling it up, and I got the first uh, first loop in it. And uh, I'm telling you, if you've never scrolled three quarter inch round stock, um, you don't. Uh, <laughs> I then stuck it in the forge to heat the whole the whole scroll up, so I could kind of hammer it into the, the into the uh, you know instead of it being like this way, so I could bring it all compress it you know into into one uh, one plane. And uh, I got sidetracked uh, showing my grandson something on the computer. And I looked over and I saw all the sparklers coming up out of the forge. And, yeah, I burned it up. And I'm just like, 
you got to be freaking kidding me. And I, and, and there's a big old puddle out in front of my uh, garage because it's been raining. I just threw the whole thing out there. And this is a massive piece. I mean, it was, it was like six feet of round stock folded up into this thing that was, you know, like this. And, and yeah, it went flying out into the mud. So uh, I don't know Far what I'm going to do now. Because I don't have any, uh, I don't have any, I don't really have any suitable stock to do it. So I, I may, uh, unless I come across something, I mean, I've got ground rod, but I really don't want to use ground rod because it seems like I use that for everything. And uh, I, I, for some reason, I'm just averse to, to, to doing that this time. And so I may have to skip unless I come across something on location in the next couple of weeks that uh, uh, really go, I go, that, that will work right there. And unless I come across that, I, I, I don't know. I, it may wind up like uh, last month where uh, I, I come snaking in there with six hours to go and knock something out. I don't know. But uh, as of right now, that, that project uh, took a crap on me. And so. Make I'm it out of one piece. Pursuing. Do what? Make it out of one piece. Well, it was one piece. No, the whole project. The only the only thing that was going to be added on was the uh, uh, was the the scraper bit was going to be riveted on. The rest of it was all one piece construction. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, and I mean, I still got the that part. It's it's the all it's the whole one piece construction that I messed up. Hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. That all right. Sucks. Yeah, and uh, you know that was uh, that was my week. Uh, you know, a few other little uh, uh, little uh, odds and ends here and there, but uh, nothing of uh, note or consequence, I don't guess. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Adam, how was your week? It was a week. I went into this week after last week being really dry. It was like, you beauty, I'll be able to get out and do some work in the workshop and and get some orders done and get onto the, the monthly ch- the monthly blacksmithing challenge, um, same as uh, Alexis there, and then... So Monday I, I run around doing, you know, stuff that needs to be done around the house and whatnot. And then Tuesday it started raining and then it kept raining for three and a half days. So we got – so from Tuesday afternoon until uh, until Saturday morning, we got four inches of rain um, air, or over four inches of rain, about four and a half inches of rain. Um, so – being wet season my land is already very very wet so it basically just turned into another it turned into a pool for the rest of the week so i had about yeah uh, water running through my property for a whole week and so i wasn't able to do anything and so added to that um because my because it's so wet here and it's raining and very humid um i think it was thursday night um my we've we've had to when we do our washing we've had to put the the washing in the dryer of course uh, 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 and um that caused condensation in the laundry which run down the wall into the power point and shorted up out half my house including my water pump which meant that i didn't have water or um power to half my house for um uh, the for about a day and a half and then, um, so that means I couldn't, um, I couldn't work on my book. I couldn't do anything. So I was basically sitting on my thumbs. Uh, and then uh, this morning, um, so yeah, of course, I've had to pay an electrician to come out and, and, and check all the wires and stuff like that to make sure my house wasn't going to burn down. Um, and then, yeah, today, uh, this morning, my internet decided not to work. Um, and so I spent half the day on the phone to the internet company to make to find out what was going on there, and there was a glitch in the system that had disconnected my um, internet, despite the fact I paid up. So it's just been it's just been a week of um, really like it's been really busy and moderately expensive, um, and I, I, like because of all that rain, I nearly got bogged in my own driveway um, because I've had that. But we've had I've had. We've had for the for the year, we're two hundred and thirty millimeters down on the average rainfall total um, for this year, but just for this month, we're nearly four hundred mils above average for this month. So um, yeah, it's just been really, really wet. Um, it's been ridiculously wet. So yeah, it's um, 
I'm I'm really really over the rain now, and I want it to end. Um, I'm wait, I can't wait for the dry season. Uh, I touch wood. To, I'm really hoping that this is the last bit of rain. Um, it's it's also coming into um, the busy time of year for me when it comes to my job. Um, it's it's cricket season. So uh, for those of you that don't know what it's, think of um, it, it's another field sport. Play with a bat and a ball. Um, and so there's a international um, competition called IPL in Premier League, which is going on and busiest times of the year for my, the the company that I work for. So um, I'm going to be doing overtime for that because the only chance really every year that I get to do overtime. So bite me. <laughs> you said cricket season. You said cricket season. <laughs> Wrong type of cricket. Um that also means I'm boring everyone, which yeah, apparently no. I do. So I'm going to no. shut the hell up now. <laughs> no, no, it was cricket season. <sighs> um, yeah, no. So, so basically, for the next month and a half or two months, um, I'm going to be uh, short. Of, uh, basically, I'll be working on my on my week off as well. So um, I'm going to be short of time, and I may be absent from um, the next couple of shows just simply because. Um, I'll be working. I will try and be here, and if I'm not here, you know, I'll have something prepared for for um, Yames and Alexis to to present on my behalf. But um, yeah, basically, I'll be here if I can be, and uh, but I'll be around. I'll be listening and watching anyway. So because I always go back and I, I try and go back and listen to um, the episodes. I listen li- listen to Yames's um, episode on Tweers from last week, which is. You know why we've, we we're kind of not not why we're kind of covering it again, but we're expanding on on it again because you know for those people that are listening, go continuing, continuing, yeah, continuing, yeah. For those people that are listening, uh, they didn't get to see Yamas' wonderful drawing. <laughs> um, yeah, and so hopefully we can get a little bit of an auditory description of of what what's going on and stay away from the sign language. <laughs> So yeah, but that was my week. So and now, of course, it's Sunday and it hasn't rained a drop today, and it's drying up, which is just my luck in the last couple so, of weeks. So my week for work, I flew to Australia and uh, did a troubleshooting job on uh, some bloke's uh, electrical connections. Uh, he was so worried because a little bit of water got over by it. It's like all I did was put a dehumidifier in there and say wait a couple hours, and then turn it back on, and I charged him five thousand dollars. It's all good. Um, <laughs> Because that's all you got to do. Well, that's all you got to do. I mean, it's not like the water destroyed anything. <laughs> I hope you didn't it, get raked over the barrel. No, it actually, it actually did. It fried the, um, it fried the power point. Because so, unlike, I, I know you guys in the US don't have switches on your power points, but no, all do. our power points, they do. I've, I've only ever seen the ones where you just plug it in and it's, it's powered all the time. No, for, that's a. F- for, that's a f- yeah. That's a fuse. Oh, do you mean uh, outlets? Yeah, outlets. When you say PowerPoint, I'm talking about a panel. No, I'm or, talking about the outlet. Oh, okay, yeah. So you've got a GFI yeah. with us. Well, you got a GFI protector. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, the outlet. So the water got into the outlet and shorted out the outlet, and the outlet actually, um, I had to replace the outlet because it had um, shorted inside the outlet. Mm, fried the outlet. So yeah. Yeah, fried the outlet. So, so um, like the, the we have we have um, circuit breakers on our on on the mains, of course. Um, but uh, and so it had tripped. Um, but in Australia, it's it's technically illegal for anyone to do apart from you know replacing light bulbs and stuff like that to do anyone to their own um, electrical work is technically illegal. Um, I mean, you can do it at your own risk, but they they've made it illegal so people stop killing stop frying themselves. Um, but also um, the insurance companies don't like it when you do your own electrical work. So because I've done a little bit of electrical work, but I haven't done that much. Um, in this instance, I just wanted the Sparky to come around and double check it, particularly because something had shorted. Um, and I wanted to make sure nothing, there was no serious issues regarding that. Um, but I've spoken to the electrician. Excuse me. I've spoken to the electrician and um, I'm going to be putting some, um, um, it's 
in because that laundry has no um, no external window and no circulation. So I'm going to put an exhaust fan into that laundry so that when um, when you're running it from now, yeah. So when I'm yeah. running it, it's it's it can, so it can what, vent out, and I'll be yeah. I'll be attaching that to the um, the light the light source if power. If it's literal uh, humidity. Okay, a humidity yeah. issue, and it's not. It's it doesn't. It only happens at certain humidity levels at the place. You can put a humidistat sensor uh, on the um, on the fans so that you're not wasting power. Well, you guys run two twenty, so it's not really a waste of power. But you could put a humidistat yeah. on the fan. Um, you could do a separate switch from the light. Put a humidistat, and then have it always on. But at the humidity, so even if the light isn't on, mm -hmm. if it reaches that percentage of humidity, it'll turn on and it'll 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 vent it out. If you'd put it on the light switch and you start your you know start your load of laundry, it's humid humid in there, whatever, and then you walk out and turn the lights off, the fan's not going to be on. Don't put it on the light switch. <coughs> yeah, I'm at seventy percent plus humidity here all year round. So it's kind of it's kind of, it's, it's it's just worth it having it on the light switch because that way you know whenever we have the light on and put the laundry on it's it's doing its job. So you know, like I said, it's seventy percent humidity minimum instead of seventy percent humidity most that, of the year. Yeah, 90, and that's, eight, so that's year. that's what I'm saying. So that like it's on even if the light's off. Yeah, uh, we we generally leave the light on in the in the laundry anyway for when we're doing laundry. It's all good. And 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 it's two forty here, not two twenty. Same freaking difference. Yes, just saying. It, it's the same <laughs> difference. Two forty two or two twenty two forty two fifty are all acceptable levels of voltages. And you guys are running I, I, on what fifty I, hertz or sixty hertz? I wouldn't know that answer. Mm, okay. I want to say that I want to say they're fifty because aren't we the only ones that are sixty hertz? That's. I think so. Because it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. When I went to Europe, uh, uh, you know, everything over there is 50 hertz. And so if you take like a digital clock, uh, you know, the difference between 50 hertz and 60 hertz is 10. And so uh, a clock will run exactly 10 minutes slow on the hour. Mm. So every, exactly 10 minutes slow per hour because of the difference between 50 hertz and 60 hertz. So. Uh, in 60 minutes, uh, 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 an American uh, electrical clock will only click 50 minutes. I don't know. I found that fascinating when I was over there. But yeah. Yep. But yeah. So, anyway, yeah. Um, so, my yeah, week, that's, uh, that's... all jokes about flying to Australia just to do an electrical troubleshooting aside. Um, so. My week went pretty much standard, except for one thing, which I am like an extreme relief right now. Um, and I don't usually talk about like my body and health stuff. Y'all know I got bad teeth and, and whatnot. I brush every damn day. My little brother got on my case and I was like, no, I, I freaking brush, you know. Um, but yeah, so it's like for the past uh, about three weeks, I've had uh, what I had thought was a bone, a piece of my jawbone sticking into the bottom of, under my tongue. Um and, you know, very irritating to the tongue, not, not extremely painful, but like just basically a bone growth sticking up into my tongue. Um, and I was like, mm. and uh, I was picking at it like, you know, I, I'm a picker. I pick up as well. You know, I was picking at it last night and it came out. I'm like, oh, thank God. And and it turns out it wasn't a bone growth. It was one of them freaking saliva, saliva gland calcium thing calcium stones you know and it's like so yay you know so like my jaws feel so much freaking better right now um like ah, ah like passing a kidney stone through your freaking uh salivary salivary gland you know so i know it's gross i know it's oh my god yamas's body you but but yeah, so uh, uh, you know, it's it's like mm, mouth feels better. Anyway, um, yeah. Aside from that, had a had a uh, uh, gaming event that go very well for uh, 
my crypto project uh you know had a bunch of people show up we had fun we played fall guys uh everybody got to know each other it was just a really really fun time um but yeah so uh other than that my week is you know compared to the rest of you guys boring uh, i'm sure i had an interesting job snuck in there somewhere but i can't remember it so you know work is work and uh yeah so, so i'm surprisingly exhausted <laughs> so uh like I, I didn't wake up until an hour before showtime an hour and a half before showtime and eh, that's just gonna be happening on saturdays or sundays so meh, deal with it <laughs> also but, to every everyone out there with a uh, Irish heritage, happy St. Paddy's Day. Yes. And to anyone that's listening that is Irish, happy St. Patrick's Day, of course. Yeah. There's no um, more snakes I'm, in Ireland because of St. Patrick. I'm wearing green. Paddy's <laughs> Irish and St. Paddy's Day. I'm wearing green. <laughs> I'm about to piss off a lot of people here, but diddly dear for dear. But no, um, uh, yeah, I'm not wearing any green, but that's because it's practically the end of the day here. So um, St. Patrick's Day is over here in Australia, of course. There's a green yes. lighter and I got green pants on. I'm not standing up. Because I promise I'm wearing <laughs> pants. <laughs> yeah, don't stand up. Don't stand up. Well, real slow me up. Stand up. Please stand <laughs> <laughs> So uh, today, Sorry. our topic is uh, continuing air sources and such, moving along the bottom of the forge, um, going to discussing side blast specific air sources and uh, fire pots and how it all kind of connects. Uh, I do believe that Adam uh, wanted to touch a little bit more on uh, bottom blast, so let's give him the next hour. <laughs> Thanks, Yamas. Jeez. You're really leaning into the fact that I'm dull and, and boring, aren't you? Not dull, thorough. Mm. See, not thorough. A, a, that's, that's a tiny thing. apartment is not tiny, it's cozy. Adam is not or, boring, or, or he's thorough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's detail oriented. Right, okay. He's going to be Don't... like, all right, this forge was constructed using three eighths, or, well, no, he does metrics, uh, uh, 30. 30 millimeter inch steel with a uh 832 thread um machine screws and seven uh coarse thread screws holding this together and they were all actually phillips head screws with only two slotted screws and and it was a, the alloy used for the fire pot no, no, i'm just <laughs> trying to get as detailed as possible <laughs> thanks uh, um you're welcome so for Going into the topic, first of all, right, Yamas did a really good job last week on on discussing what a tweer is, but it kind of, it, it, it went into it and then kind of veered off topic as chasing squirrels as Yamas is want to do. So going back to that first point, and also also um, uh, Alexis touched on a question from the chat right at the end of the of the show, which was you know about side blast forges. So we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. So going back to a twir, so a twir um, pronounced as it sounds, um, which is T W W E R twir, is the fr a, the French word, an old French word for nozzle. Alternatively, an iron tube under which title it has been known for centuries. Uh, now, it's that's not the only name for it. It's also called a tweer iron, a two iron, or a tube iron, um, all of which are entirely correct uh, so far as English language technicalities are concerned. Um, and uh, to many people, the, um, it, the word is uh, enigmatical and insignificant. It doesn't matter. It, just, it basically means air iron or, or air tube. Um, now, uh there are two there are two classes of twir so uh f as as a broad topic yames i can see your lips moving <laughs> no 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 you can't sorry keep going 
<laughs> um, so, of course, the side pass to here and a vertical or bottom play. Now, that is the term that encases the whole system. Uh, the, the In the strict technicality of it, a twir is the literally just the iron pipe um, that delivers the air. But since we've evolved or moved on from just using side blast, we now use bottom blast. The whole assembly um, for a bottom blast forge is now called a twir, even though that's broken down into several different parts as Yum has discussed last week, being the actual iron or, or, or the pipe that inf- introduces the air, um, the cylindrical or up blast part, the brock, br- the, the clinker breaker or um, what was also known as a slag crush- crusher, and, of course, the fire pot. So that is a bottom blast twir in its entirety, even though technically the twir is only the actual iron pipe. So I wanted to clarify that for people that were that uh, listening um, to the audio, as well as some of you guys, you know, I'd rather be correct than right. Um, so I had to, um, to introduce that. Now, the bottom blast twir, <coughs> as we know it, is actually a relatively recent invention. Um, they have been made on and off since, the, since we started using uh, coal, um, as the predominant fuel source for blacksmithing um, and into coke. However, the first uh, bottom blast we are patented was only patented in 1841, and it was first patented in the US um, by a, a German-born smith um, by the name of J, uh, I think it was James uh, Lorbach um, or Johann Lorbach. Uh, and basically, he was a, a smith, a professional smith. worked with, worked in an industrial um, an industrial shop, um, and discussed it with uh, his fellow um, workers, his fellow blacksmiths, um, and spent a long time trying to uh, find this, find a design, or come up with a design that would work as a as a easily producible bottom blast twir. Uh, that would solve the problems that they were having um, with clinker and, and and slag in the bottom of forges and ashes and stuff like that. And there was it was the first uh, indu- uh, design, patented design for um, a bottom blast twir. Now, uh, if, for those of you that are watching now, um, or those of you who want to look it up, um, I have a picture just behind me of of the the Lorbach twir that was painted patented in 1841. For those of you that don't have access and are listening to later on, jump onto Google um, uh, Google Patents and you can look up the Lorbach twir, um, and it should it should come up um, fairly easily. Uh, if you don't, if you can't find it. Drop us an email, and that's at practicalblacksmith at gmail dot com, and we'll send you through. Um, I'll, I'll send you through a, a link to um, the original patent um, from eighteen forty one. So we can do that. We have the technology. So yeah, feel free to contact us. Um, but yeah, so basically, um, the issue, the reason why it came up with it, um, so uh, that they they felt it necessary to have uh, necessary to have a vertical blast to it. Um, even though many had been conjectured and suggested, the greatest objection being the adhesion of slag in the, quali- the, the, the quantity of the iron that they were forging at the time and a deposit of, uh, of the smaller or minute particles of slag and cinder in the chamber, which, of course, many people have experienced, and Yama has talked about it, choking up the airflow sometimes. Um, so uh, basically, Mr. Lorback, um designed a triangular type of uh, slag crusher or, or what we now know as a, as a clinker breaker uh, with a handle off to the side on a, on a bar that basically um, that that one turning it um, it broke up the, the 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 clinker so this that was the first um, design of that type of thing there since then, of course, uh, particularly during the, the, the end of the 1800s, uh, the last, late, late 19th century, um, there were many, many designs of, of uh, bottom blast twirs, um, fire pots of different designs. Um, and they're of, of varying degrees of success. The most famous ones, of course, were the Lorback twir. Uh, another one was a billet patent, patent twir. Uh, that was one that was extensively used in Australia because it was an Australian design. Uh, and uh, 
Um, then, of course, there was a lot of homemade ones um, for, for drop great tweers and stuff like that. So there were lots. The easiest one that was often used, however, at the time was actually a homemade tweer. So it's what was known as a quote-unquote California tweer. And the reason why it was called a California tweer was because it was uh, – first uh, one may maybe not first may but first notably and widespread use uh saw widespread use during the california gold rush uh for the blacksmiths that of course you know they moved there on mass to work around the mine sites and provide tools and 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 services to a lot of the mines during the california gold rush um and so this was a very cheap very easy form of twia that was made um in order to provide for the for the blacksmith of course that moved around or even which were located in one spot um but with a cheap and easy one so basically the california twir uh, was a two or three inch um diameter pipe that ran through the bottom of the forge um, from one side to the other uh it had a few holes drilled into the top of the twir and a plug on the a uh, few holes dri drilled in the top of the pipe to allow the um, air to come out and a wooden or cork plug in the other end in order to stop the, the air going out. It was attached to a blower or bellows. Uh, and then when whenever they needed to uh, clear out any ash or debris that fell in, they would literally take the plug out the other end, crank the blower really hard and blow everything out <laughs> and then plug it back in. It was the simplest and easiest type of... Um, of twir that uh, that could be come up with. Now, there are a lot of other twirs that are based on that design, um, but this is also a design that very um, that can very easily be transferred uh, to side blast in the sense of the only difference is you cut off the pipe and have it open instead of running right through. Um, because with this design of, of bottom blast twir, they didn't have that. It, it's very the reason why I say it's very similar to a side blast, particularly for something like a J bod, is because it's running through the bottom of the forge, but it's actually an inch or two up from the bottom of the fire pot or the depression in which um, the the twir runs through. In which case, any slag or clinker would actually generally roll off the side or roll down and coagulate in the bottom of that fire pit, allowing the smith at the end of the day of forging or whatnot to use a poker or, or tongs or whatnot to pull that um, to pull that slag, clinker, drag and snot, whatever you want to call it, pull it out and discard it. Or, of course, do that prior to forge welding. So that was something that was brought up last week and Alexa said, you know, how does it stop? Up, and that's that generally because a particular with a side blast forge, um, you see a lot of the commercial ones uh, or pictures, the old commercial ones, where you have that that air cooled twir really like prominently out the side and above the um, you've got the generally the base of the forge. Those are and if, and if you look at um, even even old commercial pictures, and even if you get access to um, an old uh, uh, rivet forge or stuff like that those are actually supposed to have some sort of lining on the bottom so you're supposed to build up that fire pot which generally with clay or fire brick or, or or fire putty or something like that in the old days it generally was some sort of clay um, or dirt uh, in order to to create some sort of pie, fire pot and the same is true for a lot of um, the side blast twirs that you know they were generally an inch or so above that base plate um, and over time, you were supposed to, you know, protect that base plate of iron um, with some sort of clay or whatnot, um, and then you would build up the sides uh, of that of the uh, blower, or you would you would mound the coal in front of the actual blower, and you would have some sort of space underneath for the slag and the clinker to fall down. Also, with with the way the air was entering from a side blast forge, it would come in and then go up. So when clinker would come down, it would still settle down. It wouldn't really clog unless there was a, a, a really significant amount of clinker uh, or slag. It really wouldn't build up to the point where it could actually clog the airflow. And if it did, it was just a matter of getting a, um, a poker in there and picking out the bits just as you would with, you know, a, a bottom blast forge. So that is the basic covering on... On, and, and expanding on what Yamez was saying last week about about 
um, about TWIRS and also answering some of the questions that were asked um, regarding, uh, you know, difference between side blast and bottom blast. Now, I actually had this discussion with Roy about um, a few months ago now uh, about, you know, the how in Yamas is raising hand to go ahead. Yes. Okay. So before you change the subject, I we new T-shirt idea for you that you need to wear uh, a lot when you're out there, uh, Adam. It's a picture of a clinker breaker, and on the back it has to say uh, "breaker of slag" or "breaker of slags." <laughs> slag breaker. Slag breaker. <clears throat> okay, so so for those of you that aren't. Uh, accustomed <laughs> to Australian English, and slag is not a word that I use very co- often. Um, it's slag crude. is a very, very crude um, uh, Australian colloquialism for a woman of low social and uh, status and low class, um, like my ex-wife. Often, often unsavory. It's just it's usually it's very often used as an insult. Um, Yamez is aware of it because he likes to watch it a, 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 um, a women's prison of show. <laughs> women's prison show, exactly. So, <laughs> and that show was called Wentworth, but um, which is a well-known Australian prison, Australian women's prison. So, um, yes, but so the, the, in, in Australia, the term slag is has a, has a dual meaning, not only for you know the the byproducts of metalworking, but also yeah, it's an unsavoury um, or a derogatory term regarding women of of, of low character, of so, loose morals, and yeah, of loose morals, but generally of low character. So I add that, like I said, I generally don't use that term because it's not a very nice term to use. Um, but yeah, That's why so, the shirt would be hilarious. It would be. It would definitely be an eye raiser in um, in Australia, considering that there's an unofficial um, Northern Territory. And and for those of you, I'm going to spell it because that's the way it's supposed to be used. In the Northern Territory, there is an unofficial ad campaign called C U. It's let's spell C U and then in the and then N T because Northern Territory, so you in the Northern Territory. So it's, and, and, but in big letters, big orange letters, it says C-U, and then little white writing says in the, and then big orange letters again, N-T. And I'm sure most of you can work out how that looks. <laughs> they, have those, they have one of those in Canada too, because Canada has the Northern Territories. Mm. And, you know, it's, and, and, and obviously that word is popular in Canada as, as a term of endearment as well. Yes, yes. So, so, um, so it's it's rather funny. So yeah, having 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 a shirt with a you know the picture on the front of a of the of the clinker breaker and then have slab breaker written on the um on the back would be rather amusing to a lot of people that live in my part of the country. Actually, it would probably be quite amusing to a lot of people that live in a lot of other parts of the country. You know, but um but yeah. So moving on from that, um, no. So now we'll move into some of the more uh, specific. One of the questions that I've heard a lot is what is the best design or what are the best measurements for a fire pot? And really, there's, there's, it's kind of a, a ballpark figure. Most of the designs for fire pots that I've seen from historical, my historical research have generally been between five and seven inches deep. Um, for the actual fire pot itself, ranging to a, from from about uh, eight inches across to about eighteen inches across, depending on the size you're working with. So that uh, the, generally the larger ones, are eighteen inches, are for, uh, for industrial work for you when you're working very very large projects. So think anchor making. Um, uh, 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 like ship chains, uh, railway um, forging, that type of thing, like forging locomotives and, and, and boiler making and that type of thing. So the larger fire pots were generally for those larger industrial applications. Around eight, inch, around eight inches across for the fire pot and pro- b- between, um, you know, five to six inches um, deep, uh were the the average Smiths 
kind of size fire pot, so yeah. that allowed you to do the smaller and working up I've, to the larger. I've heard the five to six is average. Mm-hmm. Five or six, five, six, five, six inches deep is average. Yep, that's it. So, um, and then of course that that also applies to if you're using um, the homemade style tweers, the, the the pipe through the bottom, um, and you're in particularly in a, a, a J bod forge style thing uh, where you've got that pipe running through. You're still using a bottom blast style of forge. You kind of want that fire pot depth, um, you know. The, the hot pot to be to be about six inches deep. Uh, we always descend in the smut, don't we? Jeez, come on. <laughs> we're better than these people. Um, <laughs> no, we're not. No, we're not. <laughs> we have lady we, we have a Lady Smith host and we also have Lady Smiths that listen to it. We have to be better than this. Um but also, yeah, so so it should be the fire pot should be, um, you know, for for average work, should be about five to six inches deep. Um, of course, with that with that pipe running through it, you will lose an inch. So, um, to add an extra inch to your depth, <laughs> <laughs> if I found it with that, oh, I've right, got it. I'm going to step away. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, and and you want that the, the top to be. Um, the, the, you know, in a in a in a angled depth um, from you know three two three inches across up to you know eight odd inches diameter at the at the top of the opening of the fire pot. Um, now, again, that all depends on the size of work you're doing. Uh, there's another design that I have access to that which which was on average about six inches deep to the bottom it was about six inches across at the bottom and only eight inches across at the top and then that was angled out wider um as it was um able to accept in, uh, across 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 the whole across the whole um forge pan it was it was uh you know angled down at a at a very easy taper so you know you could spread that you, you you would end up building up a layer of ash, um, which of course helps protect your forge a little bit um, and helps uh, re uh, retain the heat um, as you use. Now, again, you should, <coughs> according to the historical sources, all forges should be lined um, of some description. Yeah. Realizing that it's also no. it's also a working tool. Right, so you know your your forge your forge will never last as long as your anvil. It's not designed to. Um, they will your fire pot, your twigs, or um, your forge table will burn out eventually, and you will have to replace them. It, it but but that could be fifteen twenty years of use. Um, you know, we were we were talking with we we're talking in regards to um, to. I'm talking regards to blacksmiths that worked over a lifetime, uh, and they would they would you know change forges, rebuild forges, whatnot. Um, and the part of the reason of that is, of course, as we all know, adding water to coal to help it coke up actually does create a mild acid. So um, you know, particularly mixing with stuff like sulfur and whatnot, um, it, 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 you know, you you do you do slowly corrode um, the the iron or the steel in the base of the forges as you use them over time, um, in, in conjunction with heat, humidity, all that type of thing. So be aware that you know you aren't designed to they aren't designed to last forever. Yamas, I know you've already replaced one forge hood on your oh yeah on your your forge, you know, and that w and 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 that's not and if if you think about it logically, you know. That's not just from um, you know rain and humidity. That's from the 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 contents of of whatever you, you're forging and stuff like that. They wear out. Things wear out. So take keep that in mind. That's also true of a twigger. Um, you know, particularly if you're using something like a pipe running through the bottom of your forge um, or or a side blast. You know, that heat they will they will melt. They will corrode. They will you know particularly if things go wrong. Uh, they will last a long time. I mean, I'm still using the same the same piece of um, black pipe that I started using when I when I first got blacksmithing back. You know, what that's what five six years ago now. Um, so, you know, that's that's 
I'm still using the same bit of pipe and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Um, it's, it's not even, you know, slightly melted a little bit. So uh, you can still use them for a long time. But being with these are replaceable sources that you may have to replace at some stage in the future. So do we have any questions from the chat? I kind of just, just looked over and saw Alexis's comment. <laughs> and... I'm going to let you guys take over and just answer questions that you guys read because screw you guys. <laughs> I'm playing with saturation and hue shift. Um, no, uh, jokes aside, because I got thousands of them. Um, it, it, hey, we have a donut in the a donut in the uh, chat today. The type of forge you would use be it side the type of uh, air source and uh, uh whether it be side blast or bottom blast um you wouldn't think uh would make a difference but i would assume like firstly i would assume that both will work for most things but there are some instances where a a, a side blast forge would be much more convenient to use than a bottom blast forge for certain uh, uh, techniques, you know. Um, for example, uh, I could see hammer making. One of the big issues that I have with larger hammers is when I set it into the fire pot and I rake coals over it, the weight of the steel of pushing down, you know, while I'm working, just pushing everything down into the bottom of that fire pot, uh, you tend to have to readjust your fire a lot. Uh, whereas if you were to have a side blast forge, you basically have that fireball, you know, right there and, and you can set the, set the, uh, um, the chunk of steel in the fireball and then rake around it and let it build back up, let that fireball build back up without having to worry about like, you know, knocking everything down into the, uh, uh, into the tweer, you know, into the, into the air mm -hmm. grate. So, um. I, or, or if you're working a long piece and you need that fire pot kind of up, you know, above or the fire ball up above and like, you know, you just drag the piece along the side of it to, you know, to work it rather than uh, convenience bends or, you know, building a big fire so that it comes up out of that uh, uh, um, bottom blast fire pot. You know, so yeah, I, and, there there are absolutely instances where I could see a side blast being a secondary option uh, for a forge, like a secondary tool, like use both. You know. Yeah, and and look, the reason why the reason why uh, side blast n has never died out is because it's still a viable option. And I did discuss, uh, as I as I alluded to earlier, I did discuss this with um, with Roy that um, bottom blast tweers started to become more prominent after the Industrial Revolution. Uh, prior to the Industrial Revolution, despite the fact that we have used coal for thousands of years when it comes to forging, um, charcoal has been the main um, the main source. Uh, or a, a primary source of forge fuel for tens of thousands of years. <laughs> um, and But like I said, bottom blast fuel forges really became um, more and more common and increasingly common after the Industrial Revolution. We started using coal a lot more. Um, and that's mainly because the, of the convenience of match production. Um bottom blasts do have that ease of use like you and Alexis were discussing last week in the sense of, you know, it's easy to clean ash out of them, uh, easier to clean clinker, all that type of thing. Um, however, uh, it's the, the, the ease of creation of a side blast and also, um, like you said, there are certain applications where it could be better. Um, however, you can't really say that with with much authority, because a lot of smiths from you know from the late seventeen hundreds through transitioned from using side blast to 
using bottom blast you know uh bottom blast tweers were became the norm became the common just like after the 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 um invention and introduction of um fan blowers um hand cranked or mechanical blowers uh superseded and replaced bellows bellows never completely died out of course but they were much more adopted than um they they were if they were ex- extremely more adopted um, and practically replaced bellows in use. Where what that wasn't so much of a thing with the with the bottom blast tweer. You can still use coal in a side blast forge. You can still use charcoal in a bottom blast forge. <coughs> so I'm sure there are applications in which a side blast would probably be a little bit more. Um, a little bit more convenient, a little bit more useful. However, it re- that that's really a matter of how you build your fire um, and how and how you use your fuel to build that fire. And there there are there are different ways of building fires um, depending on the type of job that you're trying to do um, with a bottom blast forge. Um, you know, uh, uh, according to the historical um, sources that I have, a um, a four by four or six by six block of wood is actually was actually an essential piece of tool um, for building fires in the sense of you were supposed to pack down your coal around that um, that f- that piece of wood and then remove the piece of wood in order to create a cavern um, for your kind of like an oven for you to actually forge in you, you'd, you'd start the fire um, you know the, the bottom would heat up you put your piece in and you kind of collapse the coal on top um, and and which is something I'd never really experienced until I started researching but th- that then that was a common thing but it's not it's not something that's talked about nowadays but again that goes to, that goes back to fire building that's not not exactly to the air um, if you build your fire right you, sh- you know, with a bottom blast twee and it's also why why I was discussing depending on the type of job that you are doing with a hammer of course you probably want to have a wider fire pot because it is a larger piece of steel it is you know you're not you, when you're forging hammers you know partic- a 2 pound chunk of steel is a substantial piece of steel it's not um, it's going to heat slower um, and then then something that is you know an inch uh, inch diameter or smaller you know the, the general forging that we would do so um, a, a fire pot for a, a, a hammer maker uh, or sledge hammer maker or, or, or someone that's doing rather substantial work would generally be deeper and generally be wider to account for the weight um, and the amount of, of heat that you need in order to uh, to create um, to, to heat that piece of steel. So, depending again, it comes back to depending on what you're looking at doing. A side a side blast forge may be something that you you look into, um, or if you kind of know the direction in which in which you're heading, um, or, or, or the type of forging that you want to do. If you want to be a traditional uh, hammer maker, for example, in an using solid fuel which you know most hammer makers nowadays that i know of generally use gas because it's it's more convenient but you know if you want to do a solid solid fuel forging of hammers you kind of do want to have that wider fire pot um in order to yeah. be able to sustain maintain that heat yeah yeah i've i've, um, I've found i accidentally made my fire pot like perfect for uh, uh hammer making mm-hmm you know, um, mm-hmm. and, and when I built it, I had, I had, uh, built it with the intention. Cause when I first built it, I was like, I don't do a lot of big stuff, but I would like to, um, I know I'll get yeah. into that. So I built it so that it would scale up a little bit. Um, and I actually had a thought, uh, and this is going on speculative that impractical, you know, side of things. So for a bottom blast forge. If you were to make the fire pot fairly large and wide, and mm-hmm. then you needed to, for a project, make it smaller or or bring the bring the fireball up some, could you not 
uh, make some handled inserts, you know, out of some solid steel to set in there to shrink the fire pot. Absolutely. And that was actually a, a not an uncommon thing for industrial workshops. Um, there are, I, I, I have them at hand. There are, um, so that talk about for industrial floor where, um, you would actually have smaller fire pot inserts, um, that you would use in order to make a fire pot smaller to save fuel, to make it more efficient, um, when you were working on, uh, a s smaller parts and stuff like that. And of course, in this, in this particular instance, I'm generally talking about industrial forging, particularly with locomotives. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of, um, the industrial forging information that I have access to, um, talks about, um, locomotive forging, boil makers, trains, that type of thing. Um, but yes, there were inserts that they would use, particularly for bottom bath forges, um, that they would use to slip into a twir in order to make them smaller for forging smaller parts. Like, um, for example, your um, your uh, decorative railings and stuff like that, um, smaller springs, doors, the doors, or or the boil, uh, the the control tr control arms and stuff like that. Um, where they wouldn't need such big fires that you would use when you're forging, you know, brakes or springs or stuff like that for or for the for the actual locomotives themselves, um, or the rivets or whatnot. So they would they would definitely absolutely have um, smaller inserts that they would put in. Um, mind you, they weren't so much handled as you know they would they would build that fire and they'd be working on that thing for a day or two. So, you know, that those, those, that they would, they would have time to, you know, cool down after use or whatnot when they were going back to forging something bigger. Um, but yeah, for, um, and you've, and if you're thinking of, 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 of working along that type of line for those people that are listening, um, be aware that if you put handles on them, those handles will get in the way, um, you know, Plan your forging ahead. If you're going to forge something big, take those inserts out, forge something big, let your fire die down, let things cool off um, because, you know, it's it's more convenient than having handles in the way because they will get in the way. You'll, you'll be trying to turn something around and you'll be swearing at yourself because those handles are in the way. It's just the way things go. We all we all have we all have instances where you know things aren't bent quite the right way, and it's like you get frustrated trying to heat something up because it's not fitting in the forge properly. So yeah, are there any more questions or anything from that you guys have or from the chat? No, I'm just being accused of not being a blacksmith anymore. <laughs> my 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 soul is crushed. Uh, uh, yesterday, uh, when I was working in the coal forge, um, I mean, all day at it, and you know, I was kind of sad because uh, my 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 bucket of coal went empty. So I went outside and uh, got a bag of coal, and I realized I've only got three bags, three forty pound bags left. And I'm like, oh man, I'm starting to run out. And then I looked over, and I still had a five gallon bucket of coke. And I was like, oh sweet. So yeah, I brought in a bucket of coke, a bucket of coal, and uh, yeah, I was having some fire control issues. I went down to the dollar store and I bought this. I mean, I used to have like a little squirt bottle, but my squirt bottles always send, tend to go bad. And this thing here, it's just like, yep, it, it, it's just great for just like spraying the fire down. I love this thing. Now that 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 comes to fire control, and I believe we did. We have we covered fire control yet? Don't think we, we have, have not. That is that is a not. different topic than air control. Yes, um, I believe I, I can't remember. I, I think we have fire control coming up in a couple of months. But um, just to quickly touch on the comp topic, um, so Alexis showed us a spray bottle um, that she used that, that she's recently purchased in order to control fire. Me myself, I use a, a, a plastic um, a soda bottle i call them soft drink some people call them pop bottle you got um, that idea with, from me with a with a hole burnt in the top um, you got that idea from me i did not i come up with that idea all by myself thank you very much i remember um, the stream i was doing it live and and I'm, i grabbed the bottle and i squeezed it and i set it down you're like what's that and i go oh it's a brisk a, a bottle of br brisk iced tea that i poked a hole in the top 
and I fill that up instead of using a rag or instead of using a sprinkle can. And you're like, my God, that's brilliant, mate. And I said, yeah, I know. It's like, why should I buy something or, or whatever when I drink so much of this tea that I have thousands of these bottles? And you're like, I'm going to use that. I remember mm -hmm. that. It was three and a half years mm -hmm. ago. Four years ago. Uh -uh. Despite the fact that I've been forging since I was 15. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. I got the idea from you. Um, but <laughs> as Yama just alluded, alluded to, some people use use a sprinkle can. Of course, our good friend Roy, he uses a wet rag. These are all equally legitimate um, ways of, of fire control. Um, and it, it, that's we'll go into that topic a bit more coming up this year because it is a – I think fire, fire control – is one of the essential skills that a solid fuel blacksmith needs. Um, going back into history, fire control and air control were were two of the fundamental skills that any apprentice, any 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 learner blacksmith had to learn. Yeah, Alexis, I saw you wanted to say something. Oh, I also um, uh, I went to uh, Harbor Freight this week and I picked up a new foot switch for my blower. Because the one that I have is the one you gotta, you gotta, it's, it's, uh, you just gotta hold it down. And so, like, you know, when I'm lighting the fire or whatever and I need continuous airflow, I, I got a big sledgehammer that I put on top of the pedal. And oh, that, that's been kind of irritating. So I went to Harbor Freight and I bought one of the just click on, click off, uh, foot pedal switches and I put that in. And I mean, and this, this, this blower I have is huge. I mean, it's like this big around with a four inch, uh, uh opening. And uh, I actually, we, we discussed it last week, and I, uh, uh, I decided to give it a shot. I can literally just adjust my airflow by opening my ash tub on, mm -hmm. on the bottom of my uh, uh, little Y pipe there. And uh, so, like, I, if I just open the ash tub about halfway, it's just the right amount of air with, with the blower going full blast. So, I mean, it's, and the blower's got a rheostat on it, and it's turned all the way down. <laughs> Uh, but with the with the thing open about halfway on the uh, the ash tub open about halfway it's just just right for uh, you know uh, cooking some steel. Uh, but if I close that ash tub, boys, you know, did you there's did a you ever coming up? Did you ever uh, uh, add the um, like drill a hole in it and add a, a wire hanger to control it so that you don't have to get down there and fiddle with it? Oh no! I, I just uh, my uh, my my coal rake. Uh, I just reach down there with the coal rake and pull it because uh, it's a it's a round pipe and it's a square. Uh, the 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 plate that, that covers it is a square, and you know I just yeah. welded a bolt on one side and a, and a nut, and so it, it's threaded up in there. I can just reach down there with my with my coal rake and just kick it closed or kick it open, whatever, uh, so I don't have to bend down and pull with it. Yep, and 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 to to put that. Because it what it is on topic, um, a a air control an air control like that either from the from using the 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 uh, bottom of the twig or putting a slag grate into uh, the pipe in order to control the airflow is also something that has um, that has been done for at least uh, three hundred years um, ever since blowers um, became um, mechanized and of course that goes back through to the, the steam age um and uh, earlier um there has been uh that the using that um that type of uh air control is something that has been common even in industrial forges like particularly um there's there's mention of that type of system being used in industrial forges where they would a whole workshop would be operated on one massive mechanical blower and so it and the the, the pipes would run to each individual forging station um and they would control their individual airflow into those forges with a um a sliding grate of some description either at the bottom of the twig or in the pipe itself so it's it's something that is absolutely traditional um in the way of controlling airflow so in the twig so you know that that ties into our um the, our our discussion this month as well <coughs> see it so uh, it, uh kevin asked uh, a poignant question uh, as to how does one contribute to the smuggle and aussie fund 
There's a well. Do we have a PayPal for that? Well, Adam, that, I believe that you would, had a would... PayPal. I I I have I have the Speargrass Forge PayPal. Um, yeah, I thought that's what people were sending it to. Yeah, well, uh, the, the, it, it, we had we hadn't really um, set actually discussed. Yeah, set it up because um, it was it was people that had <laughs> that had um, that had paid uh, that had done super chats into into um, Island Metal Forge regarding um, yeah on our on our live stream for the Impractical Blacksmith, um, but Which I we've mean, got like a hundred yeah, bucks I, to I, right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've, we've got a hundred. Yeah, super chats go into it. Uh, book profits go into it. Uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, at the end of the day, like uh, a, a PayPal or uh, I mean, I don't know about I don't know about setting up a Patreon or not. But uh, uh, um, it, at least with the with a PayPal thing, YouTube doesn't get their thirty percent. So I mean, that's true. That. Could do a GoFundMe. No, I don't. I, I don't think we I don't do that. I don't like GoFundMe's, but I mean. Yeah, me either, really. Yeah, no. Um, well, okay. So uh, I, I will, I will, I will bring up the PayPal and, um, and, and see. Um, that way, it goes second. directly to you to set into an yeah. account. Uh, we have uh, uh, a certain percentage in crypto that is going towards it. Um, uh, that I've got in the back of my head. Okay, um, I'm not sure how to, um, the, I'm, I'm not sure how to bring up the de details for it. Um, I, like I, I generally, um, my, my email, so, uh, for those of you that are interested and in, in know how to use PayPal, it's my email, which is speargrassforge at, uh, gmail.com. Uh, I'll put that into the chat. Um, hang on. I'll put it in words so that the um, so that the the bots don't kick it out. But yes, yeah, no, you're you're a mod. You can put in you can put in a link. Oh, I can. Okay, just say. So, um, Sorry for that. I'm sure this will be edited out. <laughs> My typing. No, probably not. No, probably not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just putting that into the chat. Um, my email is, or, or just at Speargrass Forge is my tag for um, for my uh, my PayPal. Um, if you do, if you do want to contribute to the the Smuggle and Aussie Fund. Um, Please be aware to make sure that it actually says um, it's for that. Um, of course, I do use this for business purposes as well. I do receive and send payments regarding um, regarding other other business things. So, I, if if I receive it, I do know where who it's from and what it's for. So I can set that money aside and I don't use it for other other purposes. So, um, just just let you know that. Um, and of course, you know, same. If 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 you do um, send it through as a super chat to uh, the Impractical Blacksmith while we're here at Island uh, Metal Forge, that does get earmarked as well. Please be aware that that does also. You know, YouTube will take its its um, at thirty cents. But um, no, sorry, I spelled it wrong. It's it trail dust. Thanks for that. <laughs> Speargrass Forge, not Frodge. Um, uh, hang on. I can't oh, spell. I didn't remove that old one there. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll do that now. Uh, hang on. Remove. There we go. All right. So, yeah. Um, Speargrass. <laughs> Yeah, spear grass. But yeah, spear so grass. yeah, like I said. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, now everyone's picking on my spelling. Thanks, Phil. Uh, I'm Australian. I'm upside down. Remember, I'm doing this hanging from the ceiling. 
I still maintain that I'm the one on top and you guys are upside down. But anyway, it is what it is. <coughs> but yes. Um, but that's, that's for the Smuggler and Aussie Fund. Um, and things going ideally. Um, it works out, but if not, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll build up slowly and, and get there. Um, I haven't done a recent tally on what I've got. Um, if I look into the account, uh, I think I'm sitting about $400 odd. Um, let me have a quick look. I'd have to run through several transactions and stuff to find out exactly what we have in yeah. the Impractical Blacksmith's account. Uh, yeah, uh, but my, 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 my personal account, um, keeping track of what I've put aside for it, is about is about four hundred four hundred and thirty odd dollars um, Australian, which is still is still a, a a fair chunk away from what is necessary to come over. Unfortunately, an Australian traveling to the US for a few weeks isn't a cheap endeavor, um, but we'll get there eventually. That's for sure. I am coming. I also wanted to bring up. Uh, 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 is- for those of you that listen to the podcast, uh, you might have noticed that uh, last week I had a flurry of editing activity. Uh, I spent an entire day editing, and I put up, I think, seven episodes, and I and I and I and I uh, I scheduled them to, to uh, drop at like eight thirty in the morning every consecutive day for like a week. And uh, so I got us caught up all the way to Christmas. So season two is in the bag. Uh, as soon as I get. To editing again which may be tomorrow i'm not sure um or my next day off when i get back to work um i'm gonna start on season three and uh we'll get uh, i should be able to get caught up to the whole uh uh caught up to current with about eight hours of editing so uh i'm not that far behind so uh, so, if you look so at that it's 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 not good it's you're going to be caught up by sometime this week not sometime in june <laughs> well, no, I, 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 it could be but... <laughs> yeah that's yeah that's good i'm glad i'm glad i'm glad you got the uh the ability to, to catch up with you know got we do we could get the odd the odd uh the odd question when's the next episode coming out but yeah yeah gotta, so, so, just gotta get back it, into that groove of doing things yeah somebody somebody brought it up in roy's stream on friday like oh i've been listening to the to the podcast i'm like <laughs> yeah yeah i missed that stream i was um i was on the phone to a friend of his friend for a birthday so um unfortunately but i did i did catch the members only stream so yeah that was interesting and and to to uh thank you for all the love coming from from the uh from the northern uh hemisphere i i can see it all in the chat thank you very much um and ben i would love to come to quad state i really want to come to quad state this year it's a matter of First of all, funding, and second of all, can I get the time off? Um, I will be coming to a quad state. That is is an absolute definite. Uh, it's a matter of when. And and I'd still like to come this year, but, again, it's a matter of when. Um, basically, my, my cutoff is June. I know, I know the quad state's not until September, but basically um, if 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 – I, I need to have them to be able to plan it properly. I need to be able to have the money by June, um, the money by June, so I can organise for the time off um, because it gets exponentially more expensive um, with every week from the start of June. Um, start of June, it gives me about three and a half to four months uh, in order to um, to book the flights, book the time off, all that type of thing. Um, and basically every week from June or into June and then from that, um, that as the date gets closer, um, the, the, fr- the, the prices of flights, um, put it this way, if I booked a week before the trip to uh, book my tickets, it's at least double, if not quadruple the price. Um, and what I'm talking about, double, it, it will generally cost about um, – two thousand dollars us return um to fly if i book it the week before that can be anywhere up to eight thousand dollars 
Um, so it's 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 in order to make the the trip cost effective and also be able. I have to, of course, I have to con- get with my work. I have to organise the time off, and then I have to organise how much time they'll allow me to have off. Um, at the moment, it may only be three weeks, in which case that change all plans. I had originally um, planned to do a five-week trip so I could do a little bit of a road trip and see everyone uh, or everyone that I, w- I was able to see um, and visit people and, and visit people in their home forges and, and spend some time with them working and all that type of thing. Um, as it stands at the moment, I may only be able to get three weeks off, which, of course, has to change the plan. So, um, but again, the more the more time in front of um quad state that i have um to book the trip the the better negotiating power i have with my work to go hey give me the time off that i want (laughs) so yeah the closer it is the less likely i'm gonna be approved for it so it's these are all details that you know mesh together um but yeah so uh we're building on that. I mean, when I was supposed to come over in 2020, um, I was first invited in 2018. So, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd spent a year and a half, nearly two years saving up to be able to come and then COVID happened. So, <laughs> which, you know, gave me the gave me the money in order to buy my house, to be fair. But, um, but yeah, you know, so <laughs> it, it was two years of saving in order to get there um, in 2020. So, um and I've been, and now, of course, those people that own their own houses know the costs that are associated with owning your own house. <laughs> it's, it's like a boat, bring out another thousand. Um, but yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, basically all I've got. I'm, I'm talked out. I'm sure you guys are rather glad about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just thinking, uh, uh, yeah, I'm thinking towards Quad State. I'm not looking forward to the drive this year. This will be the first year driving there alone. Unless I can if I was there, I'd drive brother. for you, Yamis. Unless I can convince my brother to uh, to go with me, and he drives. <laughs> hey, hey, if if, if I drove for I you, drove you, Gar- you um, Yamis, uh, you're guaranteed to be terrified, because I drive on the wrong side of the road, remember? Yeah. <laughs> no, you don't have a license here in America, so you wouldn't be able to drive. Yes, I do. Oh. America's oh, America America recognizes international licenses. <laughs> this country's the only shit. place the <laughs> only place that 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 is kind of questionable regarding international licenses and I've looked into this because I had to when I was planning the road trip um, is Georgia. Georgia can get a bit of bit funny about recognizing Australian licenses, but the lower 48 of the lower 48, yeah, George is the only one that can be a bit questionable about it. Almost all um, other states have no problem in recognizing um, an Australian license. Well, all right, we're all set then. You fly in here and you drive me to Flag State. <laughs> On the wrong side of the road. <laughs> all right, we get there. When I was in, uh, when I was in Germany, uh, they told us, like, if you if you're just going to be like driving around Germany or whatever, you're fine on your uh, uh, you know American driver's license, and uh, you know because our in our cars, you know they they our our plates were obviously different. Uh, they were I don't they were, they were different. They still were the long wide ones, but they didn't look like it. You know they they were they 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 they, they were a long a long wide plate, but they were still the uh, all the letters were in the small little bit like an American plate. So we had our, our unique plates and all that, but uh, then they encouraged us if we're going to do any traveling outside of the country, like if we're going to drive to Luxembourg or France or Italy or something like that, they encouraged encouraged us to get an international driver's license. So that's one of the things that I did when I was there. Is I got you know, yeah. Um, I mean, okay. if if an if an Australian if an Australian and this is um so I'm not sure if he's in or listening, but there's. The, an Australian Smith that is uh, emigrating to the US soon, um, down under fire and forge, and uh, he, um, if you if you're planning on spending any significant amount of time in a different country, um, getting an internationally recognised driver's license is of course the best option. Um, but I mean, if you're only visiting for a holiday or doing a doing a you know, drive yourself tour or something like that within a within a country, um, most countries nowadays. Um, either recognize your national driver's license if you're from like for example um 
uh, Australia recognises US drivers' licences as a legitimate um, licence to when you're driving around Australia. We, we, we recognise, um, you know, the UK, Canada, um, most of Germany, you know, Germany, most of European nations. There are a couple of nations which people have to do some sort of practical testing. Um, mostly those are um, Asian or island nations, simply because some of their road laws are so different. Um, but most of the Western world, of course, you know, you, you, you're pretty good to travel internationally um, yeah. as long as – because most Sorry, road signs are – go. Most road signs are pretty universal. Yeah. 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 I was going to say, we've got a, a – like our state does not recognize – or okay, let me rephrase that. Our locals do not recognize a uh, driver's license from people in Pennsylvania. <laughs> we don't. No, it's like we've got a whole campaign here lo- at the LAPD, Locals Against Pennsylvania Drivers. <laughs> I was going to say, every country has that. They're like, most Australians know that Victorians can't drive. Yeah. So Virginians can't drive. It's got to be the V thing. You know? It might be. Like, like okay, so... You, I know you guys, particularly you drive, guys, drive on the right hand side of the road. We drive on <laughs> the left. So, for example, you guys can make a um, a right turn from the right lane without stopping at a red light in most circumstances, unless otherwise signed. Right. The same is true here in Australia, but the opposite direction. So we can turn left um, at a red light. Um, it depends on the state and stuff like that. But most most um, left turns are from the left lane now in a, in melbourne specifically and it's the only place in australia where it's legal you can make a right turn from the left lane so that's like making a left turn from the right rain, lane in the us which means you're crossing all those lines of traffic yeah it makes no sense but it's available to, it's legal to do in victoria right which means particularly melbourne drivers are notorious from turning for turning right uh, right from the le- left lane and cutting off all of the traffic and getting into car accidents <laughs> so it's it's one of those quirks of australians that you know most most people think australians can't drive <laughs> yeah. yeah in virginia they call that a tuesday Mm. Um, but anyway, so with that, we, you know, found a squirrel and we ran with it a little bit. Uh, let's, yep. uh, hop into our closing thoughts and, uh, let people get on with their day. I believe Jack Pines is going to be going live in about 40 minutes, I believe. Um, but yeah, so, uh, final thoughts, closing thoughts. Yeah. Well, uh been a decent week uh we got a little bit uh, a little bit of um uh, what do you call it side blast and fire pot information and a little bit of a little bit of this that and the other uh, uh adam uh kind of really dropped dropped some uh, knowledge bombs on us and yeah i don't know whatever uh i'm probably gonna if i can manage to make it back in time uh i'm going to uh go live tonight uh forging with alex so or forging with alexis so uh, uh unless uh, yamas is planning to but uh, I, I seriously doubt that so uh no i i need and, to get back out there but yeah right now i can't yeah so uh, yeah i'll be i'll uh, i'll uh, do it tonight uh find something to work on so uh other than that, man, I'll, I'll see you guys on the stream tonight, and uh, we'll uh, have fun. And it won't—I don't know—it it, it might wind up being a combination: Alexis unhinged and forging with Alexis. I don't know. We'll figure that out when we get there. <laughs> Adam, what, what are your what are your final thoughts? My final thoughts: um, make it work. We're all blacksmiths here. We we part of the absolute wonder of blacksmithing is finding a way and making a way um most of us have you wouldn't be in this vocation this occupation this hobby if you didn't have some sort of creative mind now i'm not saying artistic just creative and i have faith that every single one of you watching and listening has the ability to make something amazing and so you know, 
find a way, make a way, get out there and do it. Now, that's not always possible um, depending on the situation that you have. Like, for example, I'd love to get out and, and, and do some smithing at the moment. Um, and it, for me, it's just a matter of sitting on my thumbs um, and and waiting. Um, I mean, I saw there, there's, there's ways I could have done it and they're just not all that great at the moment. So that's the reason why I'm being patient. But um, if you know if you're building a forge or you need you need you know, if you have you come across a situation where you might be a bit stuck, stop, take five, think about it, and think how else can I do it rather than you know I've been told to do it or the way I've thought about doing it previously. What's another what's another way? Um, I look forward to seeing you all in Alexis's stream. If you uh, decide to be there, I'm I'm um, I hope to be there. I hopefully hopefully get a notification. I'm going to jump over onto her channel and uh, make sure that I'm subscribed. Are you going live on uh, on on here on YouTube or here on or are you going to here on um, on Island Metal Forge? I'll be, I'll be going live on Island Metal Forge. Okay, well then I'll definitely get a notification, so I'll def I'll, I'll, I will most likely be there. Um, just apologies in advance. Um, because as I was talking about the busy season coming up um, for cricket, uh, so of course this week, next week coming, um, I of course won't be on because it's my usual um, my usual week on at work. So it's my week off for the Impractical Blacksmiths. Um, the week after, though, I am already scheduled for overtime. Hopefully, I can make it um, with the with the time being wound um, forward or, or bound back um, for daylight savings there over there in the US and Eastern time. It has kind of put a spanner in the works because it means that the show's actually starting an hour earlier than it has been lately, um, and I will still be at work. Uh, so if um, I'm not we, there, unless we push the show back, would everybody under would everybody here be okay with pushing the show? to start at 11 in two weeks like everybody here host wise and audience wise because the reason we didn't consider it is because everybody would be screwed up you know if we put the show to start at 11 eastern rather than uh 10 eastern would that help i mean well, we, i would say we might no matter yeah. what the time for me is irrelevant it's just uh uh yeah the only the only issue that uh, i can see is like you know everybody used to being what you know uh, at a certain time but uh, uh well everybody that is here and listening right now is everybody that would normally be here and i believe anybody who would message me saying hey why aren't you on is somebody that just doesn't talk in the show and then the only the only issue the, the only issue I've got is, is uh, uh, running running right into Jack Stream. We'd have to cut it. Yeah, we'd have to cut it yeah. at an hour. Yep. Well, we can do that because I mean, look, if 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 you push it back an hour, it, and that's of course not next week, the week after, um, then I, I will literally be driving home whilst we're live. So I will have a. I'll have I will you you'll see me you'll see me driving home in my Ute, um, and so it, it'll be it'll be a driving stream. Sometimes like what Alexis does, I'll actually I'll I'll, I'll go out and purchase a uh, a car mount so you guys can see and hear me, and it'll be from my phone um, whilst I'm out <laughs> whilst I'm driving home at midnight. <laughs> well, that sounds it might like be a fun. bit dark, but you'll still hear me. Boy, that sounds like fun. Why don't we Why don't we do that? Let's Let's plan to do that. You know, okay. Too Jack says he can bump his by a half an hour, so uh, that gives us time because we don't usually go much over an hour and a half, at least. Very rarely, yeah, it's, anyways. Yeah, when we find a conversation after after the actual show to uh, uh, discuss, yeah, that's when we go over. But I mean, the know. actual show, we we limit, uh, so we we could definitely fit it in, in in an hour and a half. So that we don't step on Jack. If Jack can push back a half an hour, that'd uh, that'd actually work out pretty perfect. So we can kind of keep everything flowing uh, in the same way. And I can stay awake later on uh, <laughs> on Saturday night. <laughs> uh, hey, Clara. So how you doing? Yeah, so nice. yeah, um, that kind of okay. So that's what we'll plan. Not next week, but the week after. All right. We'll remind everybody next week that uh, we'll be yep. uh, back in back in the show up uh, regular time for an hour. 
right. I am yep. shedding like crazy. I I need to. Right. I could sweep up. Uh, I'm gonna sweep up my floor here. And if I were to. Yeah, I I got so much. My beard here hair is everywhere. It looks like pubes all over the place. Anyway, um, <laughs> so five... before you get into your final <laughs> thoughts, there, Yamis, I want to thank everyone for watching. You can find Yamis on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. You can find Alexis at Transcendent Artist Studios on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok, and you can find me, Adam, at Speargrass Forge on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Don't forget if you have any suggestions um, for the Tool of the Week, Metal of the Week, or any other topic, you can leave them under the hashtag Metal of the Week in the YouTube community chat and Discord, or you can email us at impracticalblacksmith at gmail.com. If you found us on Spotify, Amazon Music, or Google Podcasts, we generally upload every Wednesday, hopefully going forward, uh, or you can join us live every Sunday morning, and that's at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's currently 11.30 p.m. Australian Central Standard Time because it is daylight savings now in the U.S. and the Eastern, but check that against your local time, and that's at Island Metal Forge YouTube channel. Finally, fi thanks for joining us. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button, and if you're listening to the podcast, don't forget to leave us a rating. We do really appreciate your support. And Yamez, after last week, I'm surprised you're not doing uh, um, American Sign Language, you know, fake American Sign Language in order to um, mimic me. So, meh. <laughs> now you can do your final thoughts. <laughs> All right. So for those listening and not watching, what I do every time Adam, you know, does his his uh, bit is I uh, lip sync to him, so it sounds like I'm doing it. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, no, you know, it's like much appreciation to everybody here. Uh, Y'all make the show great and uh, uh, keeps the energy going. So, uh, well, with that, we got a half an hour to Jack's show. I hope you all uh, bump over there and check out Jack Pine's blacksmithing. It uh, goes live noon every uh, Sunday. <laughs> I was like, what day is today? <laughs> uh, with that, I've got to get to to get some work done. And uh, so I'm going to roll on out of here for a bit. All right. I will catch you all later. And... Uh, don't forget, tune in later for Alexis Unrelated or Unhinged or Unfounded, um, Unchained. Unhooked. <laughs> Unhooked. Unplugged. <laughs> Alexis Unplugged. Alexis Off the Hook Chain. <laughs> Vile. Chain. Depends on how you want to look at it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Everybody good? Did I miss anybody? Yeah. All right. We will catch you all later. Bye. Bye.